Can regenerative agriculture feed the world? Well, the simple answer is yes, and we've done it before. The Mayan Empire fed millions of people using regenerative practices. It's thanks to these practices that we have the Amazon rainforest. Before the Mayans got there, it resembled the African bushveld. By the time the Spanish arrived, they were lush and fertile lands that fed the masses with so much to spare that they didn't even need to store any of the excess. So not only can we feed the world, we can do it much more efficiently than we're doing it today. We just need to rethink our methods and return to the tried and tested systems of yesteryear. We know perfectly well what the negative impacts can be on the environment if we only practice large-scale farming. The potential is there for deforestation, soil and water contamination, decimating insect and ground mammal populations at alarming rates with our chemicals. We can go on and on about the extremes of conventional farming practices, but you get the picture. Once upon a time, the South Americas sustained millions of people by creating numerous small pockets of agricultural land that were hugely diverse. That is where the Amazon rainforest came from. <laughs> yep, almost 7 million square kilometers of rainforest did not spring up naturally. The ancient people of South America created an intricate system of canals when they dug out new riverways that kept their food production in these smaller pockets watered year-round. With the initial change to their natural world, they improved the conditions of the animals and plant life that were already present in these areas. They were also able to feed enormous populations that numbered in the millions. After they were gone, this gave rise to the most breathtaking rainforest known to man. Similarly, Africans have been able to feed their millions perfectly well by focusing on smaller scale farming, run by villages or just a single family unit at a time. Most African countries buy their produce on the roadside or trade directly with their neighbors. Except for a handful of staple crop farms, most of the vegetables and fruits in people's homes do not come from big grocery stores. They came from whatever was grown in the area, depending on the season. Where the big shift came from was with European colonization. Europe is not nearly as large as the other continents. Whatever space was available for farming came at a price. Opening up that land meant that people needed to be cramped up against each other even more closely to make room for agricultural production. There was just less land available for them to grow. When they did put their efforts into a small patch, you can bet that they milked that piece of land for all it was worth. The Americas were incomprehensibly huge by comparison. There was no need to bring in these cramped monocrop systems from across the pond, but people go by what they know, so systematic farmlands were introduced and the world fell in line, no matter how impractical it was outside of Europe. And when these monoculture systems weren't as effective as they were expected to be outside of Europe, we turned to science to force it into the productive system that we had envisioned. So, at the end of the day, we are where we are thanks to stubbornness and the fact that we are creatures of habit. So how do we approach turning the tide and prioritizing systems that take care of the soil and food production? You can't exactly expect an overhaul of the entire system that's in place to happen overnight. That will be incredibly expensive, and the food system can't just come to a standstill while we revamp the operation. Let's explore how regenerative practices on farmland can be better for us in the long run and how they can produce more for us when executed well. A recent study took 20 farms that practiced regenerative farming and compared the yield of their produce per square meter to that of large-scale farms that relied on chemical aids to increase their yields and combat pest pressure. The results were mind-blowing. The regenerative farms grew a whopping 78% more than their high-tech counterparts, and this was based just on corn production probably the most genetically engineered crop in existence. The non-GMO, plain old heirloom varieties blew the Frankenstein corn out of the water with no help from any chemical weapons to fight off bugs. And when you compare the costs, well, large-scale farms lose again. Tillage, pesticides, fertilizer, and the equipment needed to administer these tilling and spraying practices all chip away at the budget. Regenerative farmers tend to have significantly lower costs. Some use a herd of livestock on the land to turn the ground over for them, and those animals leave behind all the fertilizer they need without destroying the biodiversity underneath the soil. If anything, they are adding more life to the ground at the end of every season. So no buying compost or chemicals and less watering. Water can be a huge cost for farms that have to maintain moisture levels, but because regenerated fields retain 25% more water than tilled soil does, and that's on the low end of the spectrum, at the high end we are talking 50% water retention and huge water savings. Let's also check out the important words from the Rodale Institute. The team has been gathering a wide variety of data from the research plots for more than 40 years and thoroughly analyzing it using widely accepted scientific standards. The results indicate that organic farming systems match or outperform conventional production and yield, while providing a range of agronomic, economic, and environmental benefits for farmers, consumers, and society. 
Their studies found regenerative practices show 30% higher yields during times of extreme weather, and they could, in fact, match conventional yields for cash crops such as corn and soybean. Further, an analysis of the cumulative labor, costs, returns, and risk for the three systems shows that the organic manure system is the most profitable for farmers, even without the price premiums paid for organic crops. With current organic price premiums, both organic systems are much more profitable than the conventional system. Let's also consider nutrient density. You've probably heard that food nutrients are declining, and the food we eat now is significantly less nutritious than the food of our grandparents. This leads to people needing to eat more food to get the same amount of nutrition. This too can be reversed. Studies show improved soil is helping return nutrition to soil. Studies done at Rodale are promising and show the following. Concentrations of nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, copper, boron, and zinc were statistically greater in the organically grown butternut squash than in the conventional squash. Total protein level in organically grown squash was greater than in the conventional squash. Sugar level in butternut squash was significantly greater in the conventional than in the organic. Many other studies are finding the same things. Better soil, better nutrition. What if we could grow less food, but more nutrition in the same square footage? So what is the solution? We certainly can't stop all production of food until we come to some agreement, but we can give more support and freedom on the market to regenerative farms. That will inevitably increase their profits to the point that they can expand to larger operations. Your overall market will be supplied by a more dispersed set of farms that yield more in weight and variety in the long run. The soil will be healthier, insect and small mammal life will be replenished, air and water pollution will be significantly reduced, and food waste will be a thing of the past. Just the fact that the option to grow food with the potential to sell it will give rise to an enormous boost to individual homes growing vegetables and keeping chickens. The French village of Pince did this a few years back. In an attempt to cut down on food waste, they gave every household two chickens. The results were staggering. Not only did they cut down food waste by 60% since everyone was feeding their scraps to their chickens, a lot of families, inspired by the new venture, started growing what they could in their backyards, and the community automatically traded excess produce amongst each other. A renewed interest in their neighbors and a collective sense of community saw a 10% reduction in crime. So do you think regenerative agriculture has the potential to feed the world? Let us know in the comments. Give us a like if you learned something, and we will see you next time.